So hello, my name is Chris, and today I'm going to talk about the ways in which we assess risk and benefits for several projects designed to give us global internet access from space. And just off the bat, I was heartened by Ward's comments about needing more generalists looking up. I very much agree. Um, and I hope my presentation explains a bit why. So quarantine has reminded all of us just how important the internet is, and indeed it's made our conference possible, but about 60% of the world still doesn't have reliable internet access. And that occurs not just between developed and developing states, but also along various social axes and geographical factors on every inhabited continent. At the end of the day, fiber isn't a feasible solution to connect this entire world right now. It's too uh, expensive in some areas, and in others, it's just too fragile, as this news piece shows from 2011. To solve this problem, several companies have proposed large networks of satellites called mega constellations that would connect the entire world from orbit. Since 2016, I focused my research mainly on a British company called OneWeb, which for a long time was the most maybe market viable and space conscious model. Um, unfortunately, they declared bankruptcy a few weeks ago in part due to COVID-19, and their fate currently remains unknown. Another project people may have heard more about is SpaceX's Starlink, which is an American company that plans much more astronomically ambitious things. They want to just on their own multiply the number of active satellites in orbit by about six, and they're shooting for much lower orbits, which is why they're visible from the naked eye. Now, something else to be aware of is there's many other similar projects in development, and I've just chosen Amazon's as an example, they tend to be more similar to SpaceX than to OneWeb, with similarly high satellite numbers and similar orbital areas. All of these companies, to some extent, and OneWeb most explicitly, have justified themselves in the language of human rights. This is from their petition for market access before the US FCC. Now that's interesting, because it presents a balance that on one hand is this collective human right internet access, which is debated, but relatively present in international law to some extent. And then on the other hand, we have all of the risks that come with these projects. And I'm going to choose to focus on the environmental risk of space debris. When these are phrased in different legal languages like this, it's hard to wrap one's head around or my head around a way to methodically anal analyze them. And so the purpose of my presentation is twofold. First, to reframe them in like terms as human rights. And secondly, then to balance them using the orthodox way that human rights and constitutional law balances to competing rights. The risk of space debris is grave. Only about 9% of the objects we can track in orbit are functional satellites. The remaining 91% are non-functional debris. Most of this is in low Earth orbit, where it can travel at various speeds, but I saw a modal average of about 14 kilometers a second, which is about 10 to 22 times the muzzle velocity of an AK-47. On the right-hand side, you can see what happens when a one centimeter or so aluminum ball hits an 18 centimeter aluminum block at about half that modal average speed. It turned a brick into a cup holder and in the process uh, generated more pressure and temperature than the Earth's core. We can only track Leo debris about that size. Sorry, we can only track Leo debris that is 10 centimeters in diameter or bigger. So that ball would be functionally invisible to us from the ground. And the other sort of 934,000 the ESA predicts like it as well. The worst case scenario, as my colleague Ward mentioned, is so-called Kessler syndrome, which is when certain orbits become so contaminated with debris and experience a cascading effect of collisions that renders them unusable for generations, if not longer. This is a picture of how many near misses occur in orbits in the span of 20 minutes. I took this the other day. Every arc is one near miss. The lower the arc, the closer the two objects came. You can see that there are many per second. You can also incidentally see what areas in orbit they're occurring at, and we can, I can tell you this is where Starlink and Amazon are looking to operate, whereas here is where OneWeb is. And you can see maybe why this is a bit concerning because of how busy it is already. Space debris is only regulated through various non-binding guidelines on the international level that are distributed by various interagency and international organizations. They sometimes then filter down into domestic licensing provisions, although not always 100% transposed or binding. Unfortunately, recent empirical research suggests that even these may be insufficient, especially considering the sea change we're seeing with these large constellation projects. What I've done on the right-hand side here is tried to assess as best I could how OneWeb and SpaceX were doing compared to the more concrete steps present in these guidelines. There are some positives. Aside from the time that SpaceX put a car into orbit, uh, they generally avoid creating debris. 
They also have both included redundancies and onboard tracking in their design, which helps quite a bit. But SpaceX particularly is concerning. It has a historically sized constellation, and it's picked an orbit that is already moderately crowded and likely to become even more so once it and its competition moves in. Finally, there's serious concerns about its data sharing already. A few months ago, SpaceX and the European Space Agency engaged in a very high stakes game of satellite chicken in low Earth orbits, in which the European Space Agency had to move first. Finally, there are some concerning unknowns. The extent to which these companies are sharing their data or the risk mitigation plans are both not known to the public because they're not released. Finally, the single most important step these operators can do is deorbit each of their satellites in under 25 years with a 90% reliability rating or higher. It's yet unknown if that process would be able to happen, especially with so many moving parts in these large constellations. Now that we've talked about the risk of space debris, it's left to talk about how to translate that into the language of human rights. I don't have as much space here to talk about the various arguments and contingencies I have as I do in my paper. So instead, I'm gonna try and walk through a theoretical overview of the concepts I need to get there. First, we have outer space law. Um, namely, the most four important provisions to my analysis come from the Outer Space Treaty and subsequent uh, treaties. They make space the province of mankind to benefit all countries. They make international law apply in outer space. They hold states as responsible and liable bodies in space, and they give them a duty to prevent the contamination of orbits. Because international law applies into outer space, we can start using certain environmental principles to start talking about space debris in a more effective way. Of course, this is not a one-to-one -one process. There's some analogization that has to happen. And in fact, my colleague Ward, I know has and several other people have very good literature on this. But the principles help us to give us the frame of reference to talk about an issue that otherwise is considered in a legal vacuum, space debris. These principles run the gamut from more kind of norms like sustainable development to substantive rules like the precautionary principle to more procedural obligations like EIA. Now with conversations about environmental norms can also come conversations about the flip side, environmental rights. And there was a very good panel on this yesterday, so I hope I don't have to go too much in depth on this at the moment. But the idea is that we as a collective have a right to a good environment and the adjective can change. All of these steps in theory are covered ground in literature in their kind of in some degree or other. My contribution is to try and extend that right to environment to orbits. And here the threshold has to change again because we're not talking about health anymore. We're talking about exploitation of resources. So usability is the standard that I use. So that's where I get to a balance upon which both sides have third generation collective rights, both derived from the right to development, incidentally, and both able to be analyzed using the sort of orthodox method of comparing rights, which is proportionality analysis. This method asks four main questions. First of all, I consider that mega constellations in general pursue legitimate aims and are suitable ways of doing so, but the questions come from there. The necessity of these projects really depends on their specific due diligence, that being the process, and their risk mitigation, that being the goal of that process. And of course, when we talk about necessity, we can counterbalance that with the fact that we do need to develop space resources. And the other point that orbit is inherently volatile, it's never fully certain. In the end, whether constellations like this are proportional or not, which is a more holistic analysis, uh, depends much more on operators doing more than required to mitigate risk and states doing much more than required to regulate th these operators. So in conclusion, benefit and risk are best balanced in like terms. We can't allow human rights claims to become talismans that prevent actual discussion of those issues. Space debris happens to be a grave risk to our collective right to a usable orbital environment, and phrasing it like that helps us to place ourselves in that issue. States really have to start applying certain environmental norms to space debris. They already exist and in theory apply, and especially focus on procedural obligations like EIA and its public information and participation elements. Mega constellation operators, on the other hand, really need to start doing more than required to mitigate risk and avoid infringing human rights, especially with regard to transparency initiatives. And finally, all of us need to start demanding transparency to enable further research and public scrutiny. We can't allow a project to hide behind human rights and in the process robs the very countries it hopes to help from the ability to access space in the future. Thank you.